My name is John Mark, although many people just call me Mark. I'm not quite sure why Luke chose me to tell my story. My name only appears in the Book of Acts a few times. Most of those times aren't very flattering, but they are true. John Mark was involved with Christians from the very beginning of the church. Even though he experienced some extreme shortcomings, he positively influenced the church for at least four decades. Perhaps the good doctor chose me because I was the Forrest Gump of my dime. My life wasn't like a box of chocolates and I've never tasted shrimp and I never played ping pong, but I was around the most important people of the most critical times of the early church. And I did help Dr. Luke in a unique way. I wouldn't say that I've grown up rich and spoiled, but if you said it, I might not deny it. I mean, we did have a big house where many people could meet and we did have servants and my mother and my cousin Barnabas and I spent time with every apostle and every important Christian who came through Jerusalem. Peter often complained that I was under his feet every time he turned around, but nobody loved me like Peter. In fact, he even thought of me as his own son. She won't admit it, but I think my mother wanted me to go on one of the trips with Barnabas in hopes that it helped me grow and become a real man. I never knew him to turn down his favorite cousin, so I figured he was just waiting for the most convenient trip to come along. When Paul and Barnabas brought contribution to Antioch from Jerusalem, I think my mother finally got her way. I don't think Paul was too excited about it, but when Barnabas and Paul left Jerusalem, I was with them. At that point in time, Barnabas was the leader of their evangelical team. My mother probably didn't know our team would soon be aboard a dangerous, leaky old boat. And the trip with Barnabas was much harder and more dangerous than I ever dreamed. Not glamorous at all. I miss my mother and my life back in Jerusalem. We arrived in Cyprus and I expected that my cousin and I would spend a few weeks visiting relatives, but many of them had stayed in our house in Jerusalem whenever they attended the special feast. Growing up, the Passover was like a big family reunion. I mean, we had family from Cyprus and all other lands as well. And when there's tens of thousands of people in a small city like Jerusalem, every room is needed. Even then, still people had to camp outside the city gates. Once our team got to Cyprus, Paul and Barnabas spent most of their time teaching in the synagogues and in the streets. And I was totally uncomfortable about being around those poor strangers, especially those with the terrible diseases. As we traveled across Cyprus, things got worse, not better. We finally crossed the whole island on the rough Roman road, and we ended up at Paphos, the home of the Roman proconsul, Sergius Paulus. He was widely known as a highly intelligent man. I was so excited when he sent for us, because I wanted to learn from him. In Jerusalem, we Jews weren't allowed to have close contact with Romans, and the Romans certainly weren't excited to have close contact with us, but I wanted to learn more about the Roman Empire. I wanted to hear about the faraway places and the exotic people. I wanted to learn in an atmosphere where the Jewish leaders wouldn't be in a danger to me. From his point of view, I wanted to understand Roman politics and why we Jews were such a problem. Barnabas and Paul entered the chambers of Sergius Paulus with me following behind as their assistant. And instead of the things that I wanted to talk about, Sergius Paulus wanted to hear the word of God, which is exactly what Paul and Barnabas wanted to talk about. They began to tell about Jesus, and it quickly became clear that Sergius Paulus was intrigued and even began to believe. And that's when the chaos began. The intended of Sergius Paulus was this Jewish sorcerer, false prophet, going by the name of Bar Jesus, or Elimus the Sorcerer. Through his evil actions, he soon attained a lot of influence over the Roman proconsul and had attained great wealth by doing so. He quickly saw the end of his good deal and began to oppose Barnabas and Paul. Paul, full of the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elimus and said, you are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. Paul went on to condemn him and ended it with this curse. The hand of the Lord is against you. You will no longer see the sun. Immediately he was blind, so much so he needed someone to lead him by the hand. Needless to say, Sergius Paulus believed in the Lord because he was amazed at the teachings of Paul and Barnabas and he understood that their miracle was real. I was pleased that Sergius Paulus became a believer, but I was a little sad that I never got to have a long conversation with him. 
By the time we left Cyprus, I just about had my fill of everything. Then, instead of my cousin Barnabas being the clear leader, it became clear that Paul was taking over leadership. The events with Sergius Paulus and the whole Bar Jesus ordeal had turned the tide, and I was so disillusioned, I just packed it in. I got on the boat, and I bought passage back to Israel. I abandoned Paul and Barnabas when they needed me the most. By the time I got to Jerusalem, I realized what a coward I'd been and how humiliated I would be to show my face in front of Christians who were intensely persecuted by the Jews already. Like a little spoiled brat, I just snuck into my house and I hid out in my room. But Peter was not gonna let me off that easily. Literally the next day, he was knocking on my door and when I refused to answer, he said, little boy, I'm gonna knock once more. And if you don't open the door, I'm gonna kick it in. Since I knew he would, I opened the door, you know, expecting him to come barging in, yelling and cussing at me like the uncouth fisherman that he was. But instead, he didn't do any of that. He came and sat beside me on the bed and he started crying. I just remember his big, huge hands were just shaking and shaking it. He couldn't even speak. It was nearly 10 minutes before he could say a word, but it felt like an hour. And then finally he said, he said, John Mark, I ever told you about the time that I abandoned Jesus. He went on to tell me the story about denying the Lord three times, a story that I've heard many times before, but this time Peter added some details that really broke my heart. Peter told me about the last time he saw Jesus on the banks of the Sea of Galilee and how Jesus asked him if Peter loved him three times. His voice broke when he told me the whole story of offering only a second-rate love to Jesus. But then his voice became joyful. He, he knew that Jesus had forgiven him through the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost and that Jesus doesn't just see me as John Mark, but as this John Mark empowered by the Holy Spirit. Peter told me that someday I'll be mature enough to go on a missionary journey with Barnabas and Paul again and that Paul was extraordinarily tough, but if I proved to be faithful, he would forgive me and allow me to work alongside him. Peter had respect and admiration for Paul that was unsurpassed, so hearing this prediction brought me great hope. Then he said the most important thing that anyone has ever said to me. He said, John Mark, you needed to fail at this so that you'd be humble enough to do the work that the Holy Spirit has in mind for you, to do something extraordinary. He said the Holy Spirit had given me time and talent and resources, and the biggest gift was being around all those people who were around Jesus and those who were important to the Sanhedrin. He told me that God blessed my family with money, not that I could be comfortable, but that that was my ticket to be around those people. Peter said your task is to start writing the very first account of the life of Jesus. He said it wished to be the gospel according to Peter. Instead, he said, it will be named after you, the gospel, according to Mark. For the next year, I wrote that story of the life of Jesus, and it was actually fairly a simple task. Uh, my family had access to the best writing materials and teachers in the temple, and everyday well-known Christians would drop by at the house and tell us their account of their stories. But most important was the nearly daily visits of Peter. Peter had experienced Jesus for three years and knew everything about him. John used to call himself the one whom Jesus loved. Now, I would never call John a liar, but I would bet that Jesus loved Peter equally as much. I would also bet that Peter made Jesus laugh a lot more than John did. <laughs> Peter was hilarious. After a few years and several rewrites, Peter was satisfied with what we had written. It was frustrating for me though, because there were so many more stories that I wanted to include, but Peter just said, shorter is better. So I stopped writing when Peter was happy. That's how the good Dr. Luke and I became better friends. Uh, when he began looking for resources to write his first book, My Little Scroll was one of the first things he encountered. And I'm pleased he found it to be a help to him, and I'm also pleased that his book was more detailed and told more about Jesus' life than mine did. When Luke started his second book, I was quite curious to see how my small part would play in it. He treated me very fairly in the first part of Acts. I was a spoiled brat and he betrayed me with great generosity. When Barnabas wanted to include me on another journey, Paul refused and this led to 
a big disagreement which caused them to split up. Of course, I was really sad about that. Barnabas would take me on his evangelical trip and Paul would take Silas. What I didn't understand at that time was that Barnabas would need to spend extra time in my training, time that Paul just didn't have. And Barnabas spent an extraordinary amount of time teaching me how to treat other people with compassion and kindness, showing me how to teach the gospel in an encouraging way, helping me to become a useful assistant, not his assistant, but an assistant for Paul. Barnabas was the most humble man I've ever met, and he needed to teach me humility, a quality that's not quite common in rich young people. Although Luke did not disclose the final outcome in Acts, it turned out that Barnabas and the Holy Spirit succeeded in my training. Paul finally allowed me to work with him, and eventually he even found me valuable to him. In fact, next to Timothy and Titus, I was his favorite assistant. I was faithful to him to the end of his days. One of the biggest perks of the job was I got to spend much more time with Luke, and that's how we first became friends. We all have our little secrets. One of mine, people often speculated that I was the rich young ruler that Jesus told about or that I fled naked when Jesus was arrested. The undeniable answers are this. I am the rich young ruler and I am that young man, but you probably are too. Almost all of us have blessings that we are loath to give up, even if they have no value when compared to surpassing greatness of knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. Almost all of us have fled when it was time to take up the cause of Christ. It took Barnabas a few years to encourage me to value things correctly and to be courageous. So my parting encouragement to you is this. The Holy Spirit will empower you to have the right values and to be courageous in the cause of Christ if you align to. Peter always laughed at helping Paul without him knowing it, but my training with Paul helped me become a better assistant to Peter too. You don't think an old Galilean fisherman could write two insightful letters in perfect Greek without a little help, did you?